Despite the efforts to save energy, 2018 marked the year where primary energy consumption increased by 2.9% against 2017. That is almost double the 10-year average of 1.5%, and all of this was driven by an increased demand for natural gas, leading to a 2% increase in carbon emissions. Consumption of coal, one of the worst primary fuels for the environment, grew by 1.4%, or double the 10-year average, led mainly by China and India. The Energy Information Administration projects that by 2040, the world energy use will rise by 28%, mainly driven by fossil fuels, which represent 85% of all fuels consumed in the world. Nuclear energy will be the second fastest growing source of energy after solar and wind, with an average of 1.5% per year. Although this is good news, nuclear is still nowhere near its full potential due to fears raised by disasters like Chernobyl and Fukushima. But what if we had a nuclear fuel that offers no CO2 emissions, a fuel that is cheap and produces nuclear waste with a relatively short half-life, and is naturally available with enough quantities to provide energy to the entire world for the next 1,000 years? Morten Thrain Asmark, a Norwegian priest and amateur mineralogist, discovered thorium in 1829. But at the time, he didn't know what it was and required the help of Baron Jones Jacobs Brasilius, who identified and named it after the Norse god of thunder, Thor. Thorium quickly gained industrial applications in the late 19th century, but most notoriously, it was used in a very particular experiment that would help understand nuclear decay. Madame Curie, while working with uranium and researching radioactivity, stumbled upon thorium in her research for other elements similar to uranium. She discovered that this new element had similar radioactivity as uranium, leading her to realize that thorium was also radioactive. And this discovery intrigued many scientists at the time. Right around then, Ernest Rutherford was intrigued by that. Him and the American electrical engineer Robert Bowie Owens observed that the radiation varied significantly. Later, they figure out that these variations were coming from a short-lived gaseous daughter of thorium, a new element now named radon. From 1900 to 1903, while working with the British physicist Frederick Soddy, they observed the decay of thorium into other elements, which eventually led to the identification of the half-life as one of the outcomes of alpha particle experiments, leading to the theory of radioactivity and the Nobel Prize in 1921 for Soddy's formulation of the theory of isotopes. As most new discoveries at the time, thorium quickly was promoted as a cure for many diseases, including diabetes and rheumatism. And we all know how that went. It was during the Second World War that Glenn T. Seaborg, while researching nuclear elements, realized that thorium was a lousy element to be used in atomic bombs due to its decay chain that would always create elements which significantly decrease its potency. On the other hand, he realized that it could be used as a nuclear fuel to produce energy since the absorption of one neutron would transform thorium-232 into uranium-233, which is an element that can sustain a chain reaction. But all of this was short-lived since after the Second World War, the Cold War began and the race for atomic bombs started. Interest quickly shifted towards uranium and plutonium, accelerating the nuclear agenda. The nuclear demise started with the Three Mile Island accident in 1979 and later with Chernobyl in 1986. These accidents almost destroyed the entire industry and after about two decades, the industry was starting to breathe again and gain traction when in March 2011, Fukushima happened and threw the whole industry backwards again. Although there was only one death attributed to Fukushima radioactivity, fear of what might happen with nuclear power plants always impedes any further development of nuclear technology. But thorium essentially offers many advantages in comparison to uranium, with virtually accident-free power plants. To understand that, we first need to look into the element itself. Thorium is a weak radioactive element with atomic number 90 and a half-life of 14.05 billion years, about the age of the universe. Although it is one of the rarest metals on Earth, its availability is much higher and stable than that of uranium. 99.98% of this element is encountered as thorium-232, while uranium is mostly found as uranium-238, which is a poor contributor for the production of energy. 
uranium-235 is the best candidate for nuclear power plants. Uranium reserves are estimated to be about 5.5 million tons, but only 0.72% of that is uranium-235 necessary for the reaction. In comparison, thorium reserves are estimated to be about 6.3 million tons with 99.98% usability. And thorium is special because of one thing. In order to become fissile, it needs to eat one neutron transformed into uranium-233, which is the best fuel in the thermal spectrum. To achieve that, you need to use either uranium-233 or 235 or plutonium. Remembering that plutonium is a byproduct of nuclear fission and it's readily available in nuclear waste dumps. Thorium offers a way to reuse that nuclear waste that otherwise would be sitting there for millions of years. It can be used in some proposed thorium reactors and at the end of the cycle we would have elements that only need 10 years to decay. These elements are xenon, neodymium, molybdenum, radiostronium, zirconium, rhodium, ruthenium and palladium, adding up to about 83% of the total waste. Toxic byproducts are cesium-137 and strontium-90, whereas cesium half-life is about 30 years. That means in about 300 years, the radioactivity of cesium is reduced by a power of 10. Lastly, under optimal conditions, about 1.5% of this cycle will produce neptunium-237, which can either be stored as a waste material or transformed into plutonium-238 to be used by other means. Just to put this into perspective, plutonium, the main product of nuclear waste, has a half-life of 24,000 years. Plastic bags decompose in about 1,000 years, so not only thorium generates millions of times more energy than conventional energy sources, but its byproducts are less harmful to the environment than any other nuclear fuel, or in this case, even plastic. Thorium Energy Alliance estimates that in the US alone, there is enough thorium to provide power to the country at its current energy level requirements for the next 1,000 years. CERN estimates that one ton of thorium can produce as much energy as 200 tons of uranium or 3.5 million tons of coal. Let's make a quick comparison. Thorium can be found in average dirt. For every cubic meter of soil, you will get on average about 2 centimeters cubed of thorium. That means that you have to refine 42.7 cubic meters of soil to get 1 kilogram. Keep in mind that we are considering everything here in optimal conditions and where thorium is abundant. With the same 1 kilogram for comparison, you get about 8 kilowatt hour from coal, 12 kilowatt hour from oil, 24 million kilowatt from uranium, and about 4.8 billion kilowatt hour from thorium. That is enough to power about 461,583 homes for one year, considering a consumption of 10,399 kilowatt hour as per 2017. In contrast, you would need about 200 kilograms of uranium, about 600,000 tons of coal and 400,000 tons of oil to achieve the same power output. And the advantages of thorium don't stop there. If we consider the power output by area, usually a nuclear power plant needs about 3.4 km square of land area for a 1 gigawatt output based on 59 nuclear plant sites in the US. We also have to consider capacity factor, which in the case of nuclear is about 90%. Wind has a capacity factor in between 32 and 47 percent, while solar has 17 and 28. Considering this, it means that to achieve the same capacity, you need to double or triple the amount of wind turbines or solar panels increasing land area. So you end up needing at least 674 to 932 square kilometers for wind and 116 to 200 square kilometers for solar to achieve the same thing. This is important because in the case of solar, the area that will be covered becomes unusable for any any other means, hence why using deserts is optimal. And then again you have maintenance costs, among other problems. Imagine having to replace a turbine or a solar panel in an area that size. Thorium reactors are divided into three main parts, the chemical processing plant, core and power generator. One of the main challenges of thorium reactors is the chemical processing part called breeding. This is due to the fact that the fuel for the reaction is a liquid, hence liquid fuel thorium reactor, LFTR, also known as lifter. There are many proposed ways to achieve breeding and they can be summarized into three categories, single fluid, two fluid and hybrid, which is a mix of the two. Each have their own advantages and disadvantages, however, one of the main advantages of these systems is that once they are perfected, 
fuel can flow uninterrupted for many years. Conventional nuclear reactors are required to be shut down every 18 months for a month at a time. The fact that you can run uninterrupted for a long time results in cost savings since there is no downtime and less maintenance required. And now let's take a look at the breeding chemical process, which is fairly complicated, so stay with me. One of the main goals of this process is to keep actinides away from other elements so we can maintain the system as pure as possible. So along the way, many chemicals are removed from the continuous flow. All of this starts in the core, which is separated into two main parts, the outer part called reactor blanket and the inner part called the reactor core, moderated with graphite. There are two main fluids passing by the core, the blanket salt and the fuel salt. Everything starts in the core with the blanket salt, which is composed with lithium beryllium thorium fluoride that receives a neutron from the fuel salt containing lithium beryllium uranium fluoride with uranium-233 or 235. The key here is that only a very small quantity of uranium is necessary to start the entire process, unlike the process in conventional solid core reactors. To transform thorium into a fissile product, it must go through a chemical separation process due to its decay or thorium-232 to 233 to protactinium-233 and uranium-233. Protactinium-233 is the main concern here because it can absorb neutrons and disrupt the process. Although some sources state that this step is optional, ideally protactinium-233 has a half-life of 27 days and it has to be isolated for a period of at least two months to then transmute into uranium-233. This is to guarantee that at least 75% of thorium can be used as a fuel and within two protactinium half-lives you will get the most out of the system. The process can be summarized like this. Blanket salt comes out of the reactor after being bombarded by neutrons and it passes to the first redox phase going against a steady flow of bismuth. Protactinium and uranium are removed and the remaining blanket salt flows back into the reactor to keep generating new fuel. This process is repeated yet again through another redox column and then reaches the electrolyte cell to be oxidized and turn into fluorides, separating them from the bismuth, keeping the cycle going. The oxidized protactinium is taken into a tank called decay tank, where it is isolated for about two months to get as much uranium as possible. At this stage, uranium tether fluoride is still a liquid and in order to be removed from the rest of the liquid, is introduced into a fluorination column. This is possible because uranium is the only element in the mix that can be further oxidized by fluor, which turns into a gas or uranium hexafluoride. At this point, uranium hexafluoride is pushed into another reduction column that comes into contact with hydrogen, become hydrogen fluoride and uranium tetrafluoride, or a liquid again. This liquid goes into the reactor and the hydrogen fluoride goes back into the electrolytic cell that splits hydrogen from fluor and the cycle keeps going. This liquid streams into the third and most important redox column that removes all of the fission products from the liquid, leaving no traces of actinides among other fission products. Now we have uranium being sent to the core for the reaction to take place. The core is comprised with graphite tubes where the uranium tetrafluoride flows upwards. The graphite moderator plays a crucial role in here by slowing down the neutrons, effectively creating more opportunities for fission to happen, but also allowing some neutrons to flow through and reach the blanket thorium fluoride salt, hence creating more fuel. This is possible due to some sections of the graphite being slightly thinner than the rest in order to allow neutrons to pass through. And this is one of the reasons why this system is by far the safest. Without graphite, fission will stop. High energy neutrons have low probability of causing fission. Essentially for fission to occur, graphite as a moderator slows down neutrons increasing fission probability. This is where a safety system with a freeze plug comes into play. In the event of total loss of power, the freeze plug melts and the core salt drains into a passively cooled configuration where nuclear fission and meltdown are not possible. Now from the core, fuel salt is pumped into the primary heat exchanger, transferring heat to another coolant salt lithium beryllium fluoride, which then passes into another heat exchanging unit with high pressure carbon dioxide. The gas used in this step may differ depending on the lifter model. The carbon dioxide moves through a series of turbines and compressors to maximize energy production, reaching an efficiency of about 45%. Solid core reactors efficiency is about 30 and 36%. Although the system seems very complex, all of the technology described here is already available and have been tested successfully all around the world. However, there are a few problems still holding it back. 
There are quite a few aspects of lifter reactors that continue to be a challenge, but currently we can call out two. The first, of course, is the development of the fluorination and the hydrogen reduction columns. And the second one is the ASME code qualification for Hasseloy N. The first problem lies with fluorination. This step needs to be precise to keep the breeding ratio high. Think of it of available neutrons. If the required number isn't met, the chain reaction cannot be sustained. However, different breeding systems have been tested at a reasonable level and most of the proposed solutions are being explored in reactors around the world. Corrosion resistance is also a big problem here. The need of high nickel stainless steel enclosure, which prevents any sort of reaction with the salt, especially with fission products, requires specific certifications and highly specialized industry to produce, which increases the cost of the reactor. There are many other issues with this technology. However, most of them have several solutions in place that have been tested reasonably. Nonetheless, the ultimate problem is acceptance. We all know that nuclear energy doesn't have a good reputation and that is reflected in the amount of licensing required to get a power plant up and running, especially with new technology in the horizon. This might lead into billions in compliance costs, which is a shame since thorium has a lot of good promises when compared to other forms of energy production. I honestly think that we should give a chance to thorium, but hey, this is just my humble opinion. Thanks for watching and if you would like more information about this topic, let me know in the comments section.